We next turned our attention to finding ways, practical ways, to raise HDL. And you see here in this schematic that we had already tried infusion of a synthetic HDL. You see that at the top, infusion of APOA1 Milano. Toward the bottom, you see that there's also the possibility of inhibiting cholesterol ester transfer protein, or CETP, and in that way, raising HDL levels. And that we knew that these drugs could raise HDL, but the question was, would they regress coronary atherosclerosis? And so we did even a larger study, shown here. Uh, this is uh, a study of 1,188 patients in North America and Europe. Uh, we used an improved IVUS transducer that operates at 40 megahertz, randomized the patients to a torvastatin, drug we'd used in reversal, or to a torvastatin plus the CTP inhibitor, torcetropib. We got 24 months of follow-up in 910 of these patients, a very large study. What happened to their lipids first? Well, surprisingly, the CTP inhibitor didn't just raise HDL, it actually lowered LDL. And so here's a 20% reduction in LDL cholesterol with torcetropib atorvastatin compared to atorvastatin alone. Very impressive. The HDL change was really large. In fact, there was a 60.8% increase in HDL with this C, the first of the CTP inhibitors to reach this, this uh, a level of development. A very large, consistent increase in HDL. We accomplished with lipids what we expected, but there was a dark side. And this is a cumulative histogram showing what happened to blood pressure. And you see that it's right shifted. The torcetropib patients shown in uh, orange have higher blood pressures on average than do the atorvastatin monotherapy patients. There was an average increase in blood pressure of approximately 4.6 millimeters of mercury. We did not understand it at the time, but we now know that this drug had an off-target toxicity, that it actually increased uh, aldosterone levels and thereby increased blood pressure. What happened with IVUS? There was no difference. Here we had a drug that lowered LDL by 20%, it raised HDL, by 61%, and it had no benefit to the patient on the rate of progression of disease. It was very disappointing, but helpful because it explained to us what went wrong and help, has helped us now to go on and develop new CT inhibitors, which we're currently studying, that we think will not have this off-target toxicity. Now, how did we figure out the toxicity? Well, as shown here in this slide, the electrolytes changed dramatically. Serum potassium, particularly, was reduced, and that was ultimately traced to an effect occurring in the adrenal gland where torcetropib was activating angiotensin, I'm sorry, activating aldosterone, raising aldosterone levels, and thereby changing serum electrolytes. We've also now used IVUS to study optimal treatment of diabetes. This study, known as Periscope, shown here, we gave glomeparide and insulin secretagogue uh, to one group of patients, and we gave pioglitazone and insulin sensitizer to another group of patients. Uh, glomeparide shown in blue, pioglitazone shown in orange. What was striking were the differences on biochemical parameters. The pioglitazone-treated patients had an increase in HDL, they had a decrease, a very big decrease in C-reactive protein. They had a decrease in triglycerides with no difference between the two groups with respect to LDL. And the question was, was there, would there be a difference in the rate of progression of the disease? What you see here, as shown in this slide, in blue, glomeparide had unequivocal progression. So these are diabetic patients treated with a standard regimen for lowering their blood sugar, 
but their disease is, in fact, progressing. The groups that was studied, that, was, that got the pyelitazone, did not have progression. And again, it was not regression, but they had actually uh, statistically substantially less disease progression after 24 months of treatment, suggesting, in fact, that there is a difference in how you treat diabetes and its effect on the rate of progression of coronary disease. Now, our most recent study is known as Saturn. Uh, you heard about reversal, where we had given the top dose of atorvastatin. You heard about asteroid, where we gave the top dose of resuvastatin. And so we took these two drugs and we went head to head. And we did this in the last couple of years before atorvastatin was to come off patent. And the question was, would the would not soon to be generic drug do as well as the branded drug? It was a big study, uh, 1,385 patients, our largest DIVA study to date, uh, and uh, done in a very careful fashion over 24 months. What we found was that for the primary pre-specified endpoint, there was no difference. That the atorvastatin treated patients had a, about a 1% uh, reduction in percent atherone volume. They were regressing. The resuvastatin treated patients were 1.22%, was not statistically different. And so we concluded that both of the potent statins produced comparable results with respect to the regression of coronary atherosclerosis. With this background, let me uh, then summarize the studies we've done to date, not all of which have been presented here, but we did study a new class of drugs known as an ACAT inhibitor, shown at the top, in a study known as Activate. You can read it in the New England Journal of Medicine from April 2006. There was no benefit from this new class. I showed you Asteroid, published in JAMA, also in 2006, showing that there was regression with high-dose resuvastatin. I showed you Illustrate that Torcetropib had no benefit over a statin alone, published in March of 2007 in the New England Journal of Medicine. I showed you Periscope, pioglitazone, an insulin sensitizer versus glimepiride, uh, an insulin secretagogue, published in JAMA in 2008, showing superior results with regard to disease progression with pioglitazone. I did not show you, but I will mention that we studied an obesity drug, Ramonabant, and we were able to, in fact, to get patients to lose weight. But unfortunately, this weight loss drug did not reduce the rate of progression of coronary artery disease, and so it was a negative study. That's still uncharted territory. We continue to use this methodology now to uh, uh, study new therapies. Uh, there's an ongoing trial known as, uh, as Aquarius, studying the renin inhibitor eliscarin in normotensive patients. We have an ongoing study using uh, an APOA1 inducer developed by a small company known as Resverlogix. It's a drug that increases hepatic production of APOA1, and we're very optimistic about this study, and we'll be reporting it within the next uh, year or so. And we're just starting up a study that we've actually named, and I, you'll appreciate, based upon the lecture, the name we gave the trial. We've named it the GLAGOV trial, after Seymour GLAGOV, the pathologist that first described coronary remodeling. The GLAGOV trial will be starting in uh, relatively soon, and it will study a new class of LDL-lowering agents, the PCSK9 inhibitors, and that is in the startup phase. So what I tried to show you then during this last uh, uh, hour or so is that we started with the concept that we needed to see the vessel wall, that atherosclerosis was a disease of the vessel wall. We developed IVUS. We began to understand how the disease develops, and then we've applied this technique to
to study a whole series of therapies to refine our understanding of how best to slow the progression of the disease. Uh, we're very hopeful that we'll be able to continue to use this modality to develop new therapies. Uh, unlike what Brown and Goldstein believed in 1996, uh, this disease has not defeated. We need all the tools we can get to defeat the disease. Intravascular ultrasound has proven to be a very useful one. Thank you very much for your attention.